This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. It's time for This Week in Virology. This is a special episode recorded on April 9th, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. I have a really special guest. I'm here in my office, aka the TWIV studio, and he's come from La Jolla, California. He's president of the Jonas Salk Legacy Foundation. Peter Salk, welcome to the Thank podcast. You. It's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate your taking the time to sit down with me today and talk about you and perhaps your dad, who everyone who listens to TWIV knows mm -hmm. Jonas Salk, mm -hmm. the creator of the first uh, poliovirus vaccine. So let's explore a little bit about your history and we'll talk a, a bit about polio vaccines in the future. Good, okay. Happy. So I know from, I have to say that um, I, I teach virology course. Today happens to be the vaccine lecture. And every year I talk about the history of polio vaccines and IPV, of course, is a big one. And one of my students last year gave me this, which I wanted to show to you. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen this. I think that I have. Just it's, um, it's from Boy's Life. It's uh -huh. a cartoon. That's great. And it's called Dr. Jonas Salk, Man of Science. And uh -huh. it shows him developing the polio vaccine and then in the end getting um, citation from President Eisenhower. Yeah. I don't know. Do you remember that? I don't um, know how, how old you were at the time. I was 11 years old, and I do remember, wow. I, I don't remember the moment of when the citation was physically handed over, but I certainly remember being in Eisenhower's office. So I know from reading um, books about your dad that uh, he was born here in the city, right? He was. And he was educated here with the city college? City college, and then NYU for medical school, and Mount Sinai was his uh, internship. Right, and you know, Mount Sinai is where I got my PhD. Uh -huh. I crossed paths. Uh -huh. I only met your dad once. It was at a 1981 meeting in Washington to talk about eradication of polio. And your dad was there, and Albert Sabin, um, Joe Melnick. You know, see, there's some of the big names. Uh, in polio. I didn't actually get to talk to him, but I heard mm -hmm. his talk, and that was the only time I had seen him. Um, were you, w sorry. No, ahead. I was just going to, so, so the, um, the meeting was on eradication itself. Was that the issue? Here, let me, uh, I'm going to get the poster. I have it. Sure, good. So this is the poster for the meeting. It's a Fogarty uh, conference on polio control. Control, okay. And um, Dorothy Horstman was there. I don't know if you know that name from polio I, I as do. well. I asked her why the black didn't go all the way. And she said, because that's how far we have to go in eradicating polio. Okay, so this was about control. Not, eradication wasn't yet spoken. Mm -hmm. So this was 1983. Uh -huh. So, But it was on people's minds because I think right. it was five years later that WHO stated we're going to eradicate polio. Anyway, I'll show this uh, to the listeners a bit later. I'm very proud I kept this all these years. Very few things mm -hmm. I keep for that long. So over the years I have just read a lot about uh, your dad's work, of course, and we work on polio in my lab, so, so I'm quite familiar with it. So I want to start by just exploring a little bit of, uh, of your background. I guess you were born here in New York City, right? No, no. I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My father ah. had gone to Ann Arbor to work with Tommy Francis mm -hmm. on an influenza vaccine in 1941. Uh, I was born in 1944. Then uh, he moved. Wow. So that was right. That's where he got his first vaccine experience, right? Yes. So he, in fact, developed the first influenza vaccine. That team of people did, yes. And that was a formalin inactivated. It was. And that's where he got the idea to make a formalin inactivated polio vaccine, I guess, right? Well, he actually um, was bitten by the vaccine bug, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, when he was in medical school. And his microbiology professor gave two 
lectures on vaccines. The first had to do with bacterial vac vaccines against bacterial diseases. And uh, in that lecture, he said that for uh, bacterial diseases, diphtheria, tetanus uh, examples, um, you can use inactivated materials mm -hmm. to, um, as an effective vaccine for, uh, for prevention. Um, then in the next lecture, he said, when it comes to viral diseases, you can't do that. You need to have a living virus in order to induce protective immunity. <laughs> and my father just didn't understand that. He said, both of these statements can't be true. And that set him on the course of trying, of wanting to pursue an inactivated vaccine against a viral disease. Right. And so his experience with influenza showed that that could be done. Yeah, he actually started work with Tommy Francis um, in, when he was at NYU mm -hmm. in medical school uh, and, and then went to Michigan after, after he completed his training to continue that work. So you were born in Michigan, mm -hmm. and then after Michigan you moved to Pittsburgh? In 1947, I was three and a half years old. The family moved outside of Pittsburgh to a mm -hmm. little community called Wexford. My father commuted right. to the laboratory in Pittsburgh. I guess you don't remember much from those days. Oh, I remember a lot from those days, but I'm not whether whether it, <laughs> it's exactly pertinent to the um, <laughs> vaccines and so on. I have a lot of memories of, of childhood. So you remember moving to Pittsburgh? Oh, absolutely. I wow. remember driving into Pittsburgh at night and seeing the blast furnaces. Wow, I don't remember anything before five years of age. Uh -huh. uh, I, I grew up in this area in uh -huh. New Jersey, and I can I can remember very little, but. Um, well, that's just, I guess we're all different. So your dad at Pittsburgh then began to work on the polio vaccine. Yeah, when he came, it was with the intention of continuing work on influenza. Mm -hmm. um, but then he got a visit from the director of research at the March of Dimes asking whether he would be willing to take part in the polio virus yeah. typing program. Mm -hmm. And although that is something that was not very intellectually stimulating, it was a great opportunity for my father to begin to work in that subject matter. So do you remember him talking about typing at all? No, I don't think so. I remember visiting the laboratory and uh, when I can remember clearly a point when the lab was needing to expand mm -hmm. and visiting the, there was a conference room or a cafeteria where the nurses would, would congregate and so on and that was going to be turned into right. laboratory space. So I, I have visual memories of, of all of that, but I, I don't at that point have um, memories of the substance of okay. what was going on. So um, let's fast forward a bit through your career just to get mm -hmm. your background, then we'll come sure. back to that. So I, you, you grew up in Pittsburgh, in the suburb of Pittsburgh. I went to high school there as well? No, um, we, so we grew up in the country, mm -hmm. and then in 1953, when the work in the lab was really heating up, um, we moved into town, so it would just make it I easier see. for my father. Uh, we went to, I went to a school starting in junior nursery school at the Falk Elementary School, which was the laboratory school for the University of Pittsburgh, and mm -hmm. um, went there through eighth grade. Then when I needed to make a decision about where to go to high school, I had a, a choice of there was a very large public high school in the neighborhood, and I was, I, I was scared of bullies and so on, and, <laughs> and I was not really predisposed to go there and ended up going to Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, which was a wonderful school academically. Mm -hmm. At that point, however, it was a very difficult social environment. It was all boys and, and a lot of, you know, this, the kind of uh, baiting and so on that, that, that goes on. And it was f far from home. So it Isn't was... Is that where uh, a separate piece was supposed to It was a separate piece was there. Taking place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so then that was a prep, that was a four-year school. Prep, it was a, a, a prep school. And, you know, I, I basically, it was quite a different world, at least whether it was only for me or if there were just yeah. the, the time. But I know with our, I'm, I'm now fast forwarding. Uh, my wife and I have one child, our son, Michael. And when it came time for thinking about college, Ellen mm -hmm. put an enormous amount of effort into thinking, what's the right place for him? Yeah, what what yeah. would be good for his own personal growth? Back then, in, 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 you know, for in my experience, th there wasn't any of that. Right. <laughs> you went to Exeter. The natural thing to do is you go to Harvard, Harvard. and so you just, you know, you just do that and, and yeah. not give much thought to it. So, 
it was a it was actually quite a mixed experience for me because I don't think I really was ready to take on Harvard. It was I mean some people go there, they know what they want to do. It's yeah. an enormously rich environment and they can they can really take advantage of that. I, I didn't you know, I didn't have I wasn't in that position yeah. myself yeah. and it was a it was a huge place and I was going through my own inner struggles about what you know, what do I want to do in life and on, on the one hand of course my father represented this enormous pull in terms sure. of the, the, the wake behind the boat. Um, um, and uh, but he was married to my my mother uh, Donna Salk, who was a very interesting and intelligent woman. She has great strengths in music and language. Um, and she was trained as a as a clinical social worker. Was interested in human rights and race mm -hmm. relations and and so on. And um, I had my own strengths. Not only, I mean, I, I had, of course, some interest in, in science, but I was also interested in poetry and languages and, and music. And so it was a, it was a bit of a, a pull for me what, you know, what direction to sure, go. And sure. <laughs> my father didn't do any arm twisting, but mm -hmm. it just, I think all, th I have two younger brothers and all three of us, I think, had the same kind of experience of, of interest in different areas, but then just not being able to let go of the thought that how, how can we not follow along the same kind of lines sure, of, as, sure. as my father. So all three of you went to medical school? We all did. Um, I'm not going to say reluctantly, but, but with, a, with a great deal of inner, of inner conflict. Yeah. And, and it took a while for me to make a decision. Um, finally, I, I had to choose between Vietnam and, and mm -hmm. a continuing education. Um, and then the question is, what kind of continuing education? I, I just didn't want to differentiate. I didn't want to go down one particular narrow you know, sure, channel, so sure. to speak. So it, the, the choice for me then was medical school. Um, not so much out of desire to become a practicing physician, mm -hmm. but wanting to have a broad-based bi biological training with a human slant. And the, the other two brothers, the, the next one down was an accomplished actor had a, a scholarship to go to the Royal Academy in, in London um, and ended up turning that down mm -hmm. in favor of medical school. Uh, the youngest brother, um, great skills in uh, music mm -hmm. and, and writing, ended up dropping out of um, college for quite a number of years to pursue that and, um, and then ultimately ended up in medical school mm -hmm. himself. It's interesting. So my dad was a physician. Uh -huh. And of course, he wanted me to be a physician as well, but I didn't want to. Uh -huh. And uh, but I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I didn't really put myself fully into it, and instead found this career, which uh -huh. which you love. I love. Yeah. And I found it, and I think that was the important thing yeah. that I found something that, and he in the end was happy that I had found something yeah, that I like to do. Good. So you went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, at some point decided you were going to go to medical school. Where did you go to medical school? Johns Hopkins. These are fabulous schools. They are indeed. <laughs> this is great. Uh, and then did you do a residency, internship residency after that? I did two years of internship and, and so a year of internship, a year of first mm -hmm. year of residency in internal medicine. Okay. And I did that at the University Hospitals of Cleveland. The basis mm -hmm. for that was that I was, you know, I was interested in consciousness, I was interested in the mind, and I thought that I would go into psychiatry as the, the medical field that would be most related to those sorts of interests, but again wanted to have a, a broad basis, so mm -hmm. I thought it would make more sense to do an internal medicine internship right. and residency. And after the first year of, of residency, Ellen and I met at that point, she was doing medical social work and for both of us it was time for a life change and I mm -hmm. wanted to come to work with my father so I stopped at that point went to California worked with my father in his laboratory at the Salk Institute from beginning of 1972 through the time that he closed his laboratory in 1984 mm -hmm. and Ellen made a transition from medical social work into um, what ultimately became her career as yeah. a painter. Interesting. So let's come back to that, uh, what you did with your dad. So he had, while you were training, he had moved to La Jolla. He, yes. he founded the Salk Institute, of he did. course, and made a wonderful uh, research institute, which I, uh, where I know many very good scientists as well. And meanwhile, you were pursuing your career, and then the two of you joined up again. 
I want to ask you a little bit about um, uh, some of the early days. Now, by the time you were at Exeter, the uh, inactivated polio vaccine had already been licensed, right? Yes. Yeah, so I entered Exeter in uh, 1957, mm -hmm. and the uh, field trial results were announced in April of 1955. That's right. when the vaccine was licensed and introduced. So what, what are your earliest memories of, of inactivated polio vaccine? Being What's on the receiving end of a needle. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> So that would be in 1953? This was in 1953. The, the mm -hmm. first um, trials in humans were undertaken at the Watson Home for Crippled Children mm -hmm. beginning in 1952. And the reasoning there was that my father wanted to test the inactivated, there are three different strains of, of uh, types of poliovirus, um, and for each one, taking the inactivated virus and injecting that mm -hmm. into children who already had had polio caused by that type of virus. Right. So this was a safety right. precaution. Right. And the, the, what was being looked for at that point was would the inactivated virus injected into children who already had antibodies against that type of virus, would that cause a boost in the, in the right. uh, antibody levels? Right. And so the vaccine uh, at the time was a mixture of all three well, uh, serotypes? Well, um, there, there was no vaccine, I mean, in, in a that sense. My father would, would always say, we don't have a vaccine, right. this is an experimental <laughs> preparation, and it was a constantly moving, at that point, experimental preparation, so there were inactivated um, virus of each of the three right. types uh, with different uh, processes of, of inactivation, right. time courses, concentrations of, form, right. of formaldehyde, okay. and so on. And then, you know, ultimately those would be mixed together to, uh, to make the, uh, an experimental vaccine preparation right. that contained all three types. So you received an early experimental preparation. Yes, this was, uh, as far as I can see, the family was vaccinated in May of 1953, okay. just before experiments were started in children who had not had um, polio. Now, I, I have to go back and try and understand sure. that a little bit better, but that's my, that's my understanding <laughs> of it. And do you know if you were checked for antibodies first uh, against polio before that? I'm sure that my father yeah. did that. Uh, that was the part I hated absolutely the most. I did not like my blood taken. <laughs> right. um, I didn't, didn't have good veins. It was, uh, my father was extremely good at mm -hmm. drawing blood. So that was always a blessing, but in anyone else's hands, it was really... Yeah. yeah, there are many photos that you can find now in books and also on the internet of your father injecting or drawing blood. Yeah. Back then, clinical trials were quite different than today, where the, the people who designed the trial probably never participate in it uh, No, this all. was very hands-on for him yeah. early on. Well, as you know, medicine has changed enormously yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, uh, in, since then. By the way, I was born in 1953, uh -huh. January of that year. So, uh -huh. in fact, when IPV was licensed, I, I, I got it initially mm -hmm. sometime in the 50s. So you remember being on the receiving end. I do, but I should say a little bit more about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, the, this was done in our kitchen. <laughs> Uh, my father boiled the needles, boiled the oh, syringes gosh. in a pot yeah. on the stove. Um, this was back in the day when uh, needles were reused, and if they were used too much, they would get a little hook on the end, uh, which <laughs> in increased the undesirability. Yeah, of, it would make it more painful, right? Uh, yes, on, especially wow. on, coming, on, on coming out. But the, the one thing, I, I hated injections. I would hide, do anything I could sure. to avoid, which of course never was successful. Um, the thing that I remember particularly about that day was that with all of the anticipatory dread, for some reason that day the needle must have missed the nerves and, and it didn't hurt. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that marked that particular occasion Great. in my mind it was unforgettable. In the kitchen though, that's amazing. Yeah. And he boiled the needles. Yeah. Of course today you would get a plastic disposable yeah. needle and you can't do it in your kitchen of course right. any longer. So you do remember that Absolutely. vividly. Yes. And what's next? What do you remember next? Do you remember him ever, did he ever come home and talk about how, how things were going or were you guys too young to, to You be know, to? I, 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 he had those conversations with my mother, yeah. but I don't remember him having the conversations with us as kids. Now, whether he did and it went over my head, I, I remember very clearly one moment, um, and I, I must have been nine because we left 
I, I'm th assuming that it was the summer of 1953, because we left for Pitts to move into the city shortly after mm -hmm. that, and we were on a blanket, sitting on a blanket, my father and I, on the lawn where we lived uh, out in the in the country area. And he was then he was talking about what he was doing, mm -hmm. and either he had some charts to show me, or he drew some things on a piece of paper, and I was just struck by the beauty of what it was that he was doing, and that and at that moment, the impulse mm -hmm. came up in me of wanting to work with him. So I, I do know that there were conversations, and I remember some in the in the, on the floor of the. Um, kitchen in, in Pittsburgh, again, some you know, graphics of yeah. different antibody responses and curves and so on. It was very, very beautiful. Yeah, you know, my dad was a surgeon, and I never had that urge to do, <laughs> to do what he did. I yeah. think at a young age, a surgeon is, is not something that kids like, but a person who's trying to uh, solve an, an important disease, then that's something, it's not too gory. Yeah, right? and, and there was just, there was a conceptual beauty of it, mm -hmm. it was just the, the way he the way he thought about things. He really liked to, um, as he put it, to make the invisible visible. He'd like to to make charts of. They were very unusual, very idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. The way he would do the the graphics, um, things that were in mirror images rather than just all the, mm -hmm. you know, with, with axes going in, in in one direction and juxtaposing curves. And one one thing that I remember, I, I don't even to this day, I haven't tried to go back to understand what it was he was talking about then. Whether this was polio, whether it was influenza. Yeah. I think it was polio. Um, looking at uh, the way I remember it, the three different types of, of polio virus and the antibody responses to yeah. a particular concen right. concentration um, or range of concentrations. And for one type, it was, a, it was an upward going curve. For uh, another type, it was a curve that was bent right. over. And for another, it was a, a sigmoid curve. And what he did is he put those three together to form yeah. uh, a, a contiguous you know, sigmoid curve. It's just that what, with the different androgenicities of the three different strains, mm -hmm. you, were, you were seeing different slices of what was basically the, the uh, dose, uh, you know, uniform dose response. So he used to draw his own materials, really? Well, whether he did the physical, the final charts, but he, his, but he his his hand was on everything. Yeah. Did he like to draw? Was yeah. he? Well, I mean, we, he he loved the process of of putting together graphics that would yeah. reveal what was the underlying process. Think he would love Photoshop today and all the tools no, we have? No, absolutely not. Well, <laughs> <laughs> just I mean, the the when you get to a particular age, um, yeah. the technology gets to a point where you, where it's difficult to to I make those yeah, transitions. Course, so I mean, I, I see that even in in my own life, there are things today where I. I, I love the computer, I'm, I'm good at what I do on it, yeah. but I'm scared of the cell phone. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I love drawing my own graphics today, and so maybe, I, I know that before we had computers, I used to draw them by hand also, so some of us like to do that yeah. and, and others don't. That's yeah. something I didn't know about him. So do you remember anything of the huge trial, the, Michi the trial whose results were reported in Michigan that took place all over the U.S., I presume. I, I do to some extent. Now, in Pittsburgh, there, were, there, were a, there was a preliminary set of trials just before the large-scale mm -hmm. national field trial was undertaken. So there were trials in the Pittsburgh schools. Falk School was one of them, so I do remember mm -hmm. kids being vaccinated in the gymnasium. I don't remember at the moment whether I received any injections right there because we, we mm -hmm. you know, to what extent they were, had already been yeah. done at yeah, home. Yeah. But um, the the large scale trial, I don't have a particular physical memory of. I mean, there were 1.8 million kids that were involved Huge. in that. Yeah, the biggest ever. Yeah, I think to this day it's yeah. still the, it's almost inconceivable, and I. Can't imagine that your dad wasn't harried as a consequence. Did you notice, or was he calm through the whole thing? He had nothing to do with the large-scale trial. That mm -hmm. finally took things out of his hands, and he was very upset. Yeah. For, uh, well, there were, there were two things that upset him. One was that the government mandated that methylate needed to be added to the vaccine, mm -hmm. and that had not been tested, as far as I know, in yeah. his own laboratory in terms of what effect that would have on the immunogenicity right. of the inactivated virus preparation. He was very concerned. Went back to, as I understand, went back to his lab after this decision had been made, did the experiments and discovered that methylate enormously reduced the potency of the vaccine, particularly mm -hmm. against type 1. So here was this massive trial yeah. 
wow. being undertaken with a vaccine that had never been tested before, a merthiolate containing preparation, and he had no idea what the outcome was going to be, whether it was going to be a total disaster because of this minor, seemingly yeah. minor sure. change, the merthiolate being intended as a, as a um, preservative. preservative yeah. Yeah. So the government just decided that it was necessary. It was to necessary have this. to, yeah. yes. Hmm. Yeah. And now, of course, we've taken out of, it out of most of our vaccines because we worry that it has mercury related compounds in yeah. it. So he was, I, I don't blame him for being upset. It's, like, it's a scientist having their experiment changed at the last minute. Yeah. The, the other thing that concerned him, and I don't actually know how he felt about it ultimately, he did not want a double blind trial. He didn't mm -hmm. want kids to be receiving a placebo because right. he had such confidence right. and that the principle was so clear. The, this vaccine produced an increase in, in mm -hmm. it, uh, induced antibodies where they weren't present, increased antibodies where, right. they, where they were present, and that's all that was needed in mm -hmm. order to block the virus from uh, producing paralysis. Right. Uh, clearly, the, the virus grows in the intestinal tract, what we, and it was only this was only understood clearly shortly mm -hmm. or around the time when when this vaccine was being worked on mm -hmm. grows in the intestines gets into the bloodstream from the blood gets into the nervous system causes paralysis right. so the only thing you need to block to prevent paralysis is antibody in the bloodstream there's more that can be talked about in terms of other aspects of immunity but in terms of preventing paralysis that's what was needed this vaccine did that why should any child right. be receive something that wasn't going to protect them if they could get what, what would now? I, I see things differently from a, a different vantage point, and, I, I, and I'm, I'm sure that part of him was aware of this too. Tommy Francis, who designed and ran that field trial, the same, the same person he'd worked with on influenza, um, was adamant this has to be a double-blind experiment. Right. And thank goodness he took that <laughs> stance because that's the only way that you could conceivably sure. know that it actually worked. And even nowadays we have the, the, the anti-vaccine movement and mm -hmm. people who are concerned as, you know, even I, I've seen things, I haven't looked into them in great, in great depth, you know, basically calling the, the, the polio vaccine into question. Oh, it's, it, this is just a coincidence that the right. virus, the, the incidence was dropping. But you have a double-blind test. You know yes. that Kids that did not have vaccine got polio at this rate. Kids who did have vaccine got polio at, at, at this rate. So mm -hmm. that's the only way that you f firmly know that the vaccine worked, sure. was effective, and is something to refer back to. Well, it's good that he was talked into it, as you say. Otherwise, I, I can't imagine that the trial of that size would go forward without a yeah. control arm anyway. Yeah. Well, when it came to the Sabin vaccine, it was a different story. In Russia, there, was no, there were no controls. Right. Now that's of course Russia, and if it had been done here, there probably would have been would have been controls. Yeah. So um, he was convinced to do double blind. I can this is interesting because today I think no one would ever consider not having. Of course, that. but yeah. he was he was highly invested emotionally as well. I'm sure yeah. because but, this uh, was a disease that was pretty prominent, right, in the U.S. Oh, it was terrifying to people. Yeah, and it wasn't his decision. He had inputs, but this was the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, the March of Dimes. Mm -hmm. They were running the, the trial. trial. Mm -hmm. it was their, their trial, their money, their committee right. that makes the decisions. Did he provide the virus for the trial, or was that manufactured elsewhere? Um, the vaccine that was used in the trial, I may not get all of this mm -hmm. right. Uh, to s some of this, I believe, was manufactured in Canada at Connaught okay. Laboratories. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there were two, if I'm not mistaken, pharmaceutical companies that made vaccine for the field trials. I believe that Park Davis and Eli Lilly were the two companies. Mm -hmm. And then after the, uh, after the trials, then another three, if, if I'm close enough sure, to write, yeah. um, companies came, came on board okay. to produce vaccines. So, this was, so I, it was Lilly and Park Davis material, if, I believe, that was used okay. for the trials. And when um, the children's serum were taken and checked for antibodies uh, who participated in the trial, did he get to do any of that work in his laboratory? 
I don't think that any of that was done in his lab. Okay. He, he, the trials, the smaller trials before that, all of that, if I'm not mistaken, was, was done in his laboratory, but I don't think that his lab was involved in, okay. in the National Field So you trial. were right, he waited. He was waiting for the results. He didn't know anything <laughs> until breakfast the morning of April 12th, 1955. April 12th, which is in three days from now. Yeah. Is it coincidence that you're here at this time of year? I guess so. Um, <laughs> I'm, I came to New York uh, for a March of Dimes, a couple of March of, of Dimes events, and okay. I believe that they would have uh, arranged right. those because of the proximity to so April So that 12. is uh, how many years ago? Um, 59. 59 years, yeah. Wow, so he Am that I right? Because I, I think it's going to be 60, yeah, because it'll be 60 years next year in 2015. Yeah. And so he found out the results the morning. This is so the results were um, announced in Ann Arbor. Ten o'clock in the morning, the meeting was convened in Rackham Hall. Rackham Hall. And when I visited uh, the University of Michigan a couple of years ago, I made it a point to walk in front of Rackham and take pictures because it's a historic place. Yeah. yeah. And he went to the Rackham, and that's where he found out the no, results. No, he had breakfast with Tommy Francis, <laughs> and, and uh, Tommy just had kept the lid on totally. Did you attend that meeting? Uh, I attended the not the breakfast, but I attended the, 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 I, announcement. I, I, the announcement. And how? And you were by this time eleven years old, and my so you, my brothers would have been eight and four at that time. So you were sitting in the audience, sitting along in the with audience. press and government people and scientists of all sorts. Yeah. Do you remember any particular? aspect of that announcement or is it all kind of blurry well you know it's a it's a funny thing i have some very clear memories from mm -hmm. that day um, the first memory is that april 12th that day was the beginning of baseball season <laughs> and although we lived in pittsburgh i was an ardent brooklyn dodgers fan wonderful <laughs> and uh, the, if i'm remembering correctly the game was between the dodgers and the phillies and i desperately wanted to listen to vin scully <laughs> Announce, <laughs> announce that game, but we were carted off to, yeah. uh, to this um, interfering meeting. Ah, so you have a different view from the start. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I do. Um, now, I, I remember being in, the, you know, being in the audience, and then, strangely enough, my memories blank out. And I, I was asked about this a, few, a couple of days ago, and I felt really embarrassed that, uh, that I couldn't produce any, mm -hmm. any memories. And then afterwards, I think I understand why. Tommy Francis' talk was an hour and ten minutes, I believe. My father went on at length. This would have been deadly yeah, boring. Of course. So, uh, I, I think I, I just am imagining that my brain tuned out at that point, sure. and that was yeah. the end of that. I'm sure you were squirming. Yeah. And your mom was probably had trying all to keep her hands the three kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Boy. Yeah. So uh, after uh, this was done, the next day the vaccine was licensed. Yes, it was. And released, right? Um, do you remember your father at all talking about that? Did no, I don't. At all? Have, no. Don't remember that. I, I do remember being uh, carted off to Washington mm -hmm. when he was to get a citation from President Eisenhower. I remember that right, trip. which is on our uh, cartoon that I showed you yes. earlier. Yeah. Right, um, and then um, what did your dad do after the the vaccine was released? Did he continue to work on improving it, or? Yeah. First, I, I, I should just explain the surprise that, that happened as far as he was concerned. Okay. He expected that he would go back, Ann Arbor would be done, go back home, get back to work in his laboratory. Right. I mean, that was just not what happened. The, the, I mean, all hell broke loose in terms of publicity, uh, reporters, interviews, so on and so forth. It became a nightmare from the family's point of view, and I'll mm. just you know, say this from the point of view of a, of a kid. Um, I came back home, and the world was turned upside down. We no longer could <laughs> receive phone calls from my classmates because the phone was ringing so much that the only way to protect the family was to get an answering service to you yeah, know, I intercept know. all of the, the calls. So you know, it was this horrendously embarrassing situation to have friends call and get an answering service instead sure. of being able to just oh, wow, continue yeah. normal life. So he became a hero overnight. Yeah. So the press was always, when you went out of your house, so you were living in Pittsburgh at yeah, the time. Yeah, I don't remember that there were physically yeah. reported. Today there would be. The, yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. it's changed a lot. And so he had trouble 
doing his work I, because it of took, it? I think it took, a, it took a while before he could settle down and, and just you know, get, get back to work rolling up his sleeves. And, and he was, he, was, he and, and, and Tommy Francis had a bit of a falling out, I believe, mm -hmm. on April 12th because um, after friend, Dr. Francis' very careful announcement about the results and so on and so forth, my father, who came prepared to give a talk not knowing what the outcome of the trial was going to be, mm -hmm. was and, and knowing about the methylate experience and so on, gave a talk that was talking about how one could improve upon right. the vaccine that was that had just been tested, how you could move towards a vaccine that would be 100% effective. And Tommy Francis, as I understand in retrospect, was this this didn't sit well with yes. him at all. I've read that, yeah. <laughs> And, and now, uh, looking back at some of the photos from that day, yeah. there's some, you know, there are a few where my father and, and Dr. Francis are, are smiling, but there are others that look like those photographs of, of politicians who have been caught in the bad moment, you know, with something, <laughs> yes. that, with, you know, lips, you know, mouths turned yeah, down and sure, so on. It was, sure. you, can, you can feel the tension in those photos. So your father became a cultural hero. He was on the cover of Time magazine. He was on, was there television? I, I think there was an early day. There was television. television. It was back, clearly yeah. on the radio. I know he made some radio interviews mm -hmm. early on, which were key. How did this affect you in school? Did your classmates know that your dad had taken care of polio? Well, this had started even earlier yeah. um, because of the trials were going on in the Pittsburgh area. And it, it was uncomfortable for me because I couldn't be just uh, an ordinary yeah, kid. Sure. You know, I, I had friends in, in, in my class and um, I was actually hurt one day because there was our sixth, it was in f sixth grade, um, I lose track of these. And so sixth grade was when, when the announcement was made. And, and one of my classmates made some comment about, you know, that it had gone to my head or something like that. And I just felt really upset because I didn't feel that, that, sure. that was any, yeah. there was anything of that sort uh, that was taking place. But then I remember a very uncomfortable experience um, uh, first day going to Little League. And I, didn't, I loved softball, but I was frightened of, yeah. of hard balls. And, and the... You know, standing up with all these strange kids, didn't know anybody, and the the little league coach singling me out, yeah. you know, saying, "Look, there's, you know, here's Doctor Salks. On what position do you want to play?" <laughs> I mean, it's just horrible. Sure, I think that would con that continues to this day for children of celebrities. They have difficulties like that because they're singled out, and you just want to be a normal kid right. disappearing into the crowd, right. right? And so this is very unusual because I think in the field of science and vaccines, this, the, that was probably the first and only time that one individual received the credit yeah. for doing that. Even though it's a team effort, we all know that. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't remember any other vaccine where it was met with such relief and this person is yeah. our hero. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I, you know, I understand that um, it was difficult for you kids, but I, I guess you must see it as a, the nation really was relieved that this had been done. So yeah. they were grateful. No, the lifting of the fear was yeah. enormous. And, and in, in some way, I think a hero was wanted. They wanted somebody sure. to identify with. And this was very, it was, a, it was a complex and an uncomfortable situation all the way around. I mean, my father never wanted the vaccine to be called the Salk vaccine. <laughs> it had to be called something short. It should be the Pitt vaccine. It was right. done at the University of Pittsburgh. The press wouldn't have it. Yeah, they, want, they wanted, yeah, they wanted the single person's name, and, and then the, the discomfort uh, with in his you know, the, the colleagues that worked on the vaccine and so on. And um, it, now that's why nowadays we spread the credit, because after all, if an AIDS vaccine, for example, is developed, you won't see any one person associated with it. You'll yeah. see a team of people, because uh, it's much easier for a team to absorb that than a, than a single. So it's a unique time in history. Right, it is a disease that was scary. One person yeah. uh, directed a team and then got the credit for it. I yeah. think I think it's a fabulous story, and many people have written about it, as you know. So, mm -hmm. now you must have. So as you went to Exeter and then Harvard and uh, and then um, Johns Hopkins. Hopkins, did did his fame f uh, leave you alone eventually, or did people continually say, "Oh, are you Jonas Salk's son?" No, that continued, yeah. but you know, the, it, it began to to evolve for me. And as I got older, although there still was the squirm factor, mm -hmm. um, I, I began to want to 
take advantage of the positive right. in terms of the opportunities, not on an individual basis, but to, to try and do something positive that would be of, of mm -hmm. value in the world and in, in some way relate to that accomplishment and, and build on it. So that's, there's, there's the two sides sure, sure. to it. And, and I think that at least now at, at this point in life, I'm wanting fully as, as much as possible to reflect back on what my father and his co-workers did and what he did and accomplished in the later uh, part of, of his life and that this should be a ground for, uh, for moving forward right. and to making further accomplishments. Let me ask you a few more questions about, I call it IPV. Sure. I say IPV developed by Jonas Salk. And I, in my lecture today, I'll, I have a photograph of your dad on the cover of one of the New York City newspapers on April 12, 1955. And I want the students to understand what an important uh, day that was. Um, so, as you know, a few, a few weeks after release, there were a number of cases associated with use of the vaccine produced by Cutter Laboratories. I'm sure your father was completely upset about that. Do you remember that at all? Or was that something? No, I don't have a clear memory of, of his reaction to it. I don't know to what extent that was being talked about within the family right. down to the level of the of the kids, but obviously in retrospect an enormously upsetting situation for him. Sure, I can imagine. Uh, then, So then it's in the 50s that he moved to Salk, or he founded Salk, it was that in the 50s or 60s? Let's, uh, since, since Cutter was brought up, let's at least say one or two more sure. words about it just to put a period at the end of at the end of that sentence, right. you know, I've um, there, there's been a lot written about it. Mm -hmm. Paul Offit, has written a book wonderful about it, right? person, has written a book about it. I I read the book. I really appreciate the details mm -hmm. that he went into and the perspective that he has. But there's just one f element where I see th I, I, I feel things a bit okay. differently from my, I think the way that that he presented them. I mean, basically. Um, Paul's concern had to do with the effect that this Cutter episode had on the um, well, the way vaccines are, are treated and right. the in, in, diff, uh, what, in insurance difficulties and, and, and so on and, and liability issues. Um, so his, his vantage point was that Cutter wasn't to blame. And, and I have to say that I don't agree with that mm -hmm. because as I read, look back and review what was done at that point, my father had his own, his, his laboratory. This was his responsibility mm -hmm. and his continuing work on, on the vaccine. He put together a procedure for how to produce a vaccine so that it would be both effective and safe. The principle that he relied on was the so-called linear inactivation. That you, if you choose the conditions correctly, temperature, pH, uh, length of time, you, uh, concentration of, of formaldehyde, of formalin, you can, we have a situation where the inactivation on a log scale is, is linear mm -hmm. and therefore one would in theory be able to project a complete inactivation right. after a certain point in time. If you don't have the conditions correct, you have a cur the inactivation is, is curvilinear. Right. So it, it, would nev it may never go to mm -hmm. extinction. So the basic, basic principle for the manufacturers was take samples along the way during the inactivation, mm -hmm. plot them. If you have a linear curve, you know you're doing it correctly. Cutter didn't do that. They had no idea what the process of inactivation was. There was a problem in the filtration step. Mm -hmm. There was a problem with, with storing the samples right. after filtration right. for a prolonged period of time with cellular debris, sediment, that would then protect the virus and keep mm -hmm. it from, uh, from uh, being in contact with the, f the formaldehyde. Right. There was, I'm sorry, I... I, I it's fine. Just, you know, there's no excuse for their not yeah. following the proce procedure that was set out. The excuse was, oh, but the government didn't require that. Mm -hmm. The government didn't require uh, your giving records of the number of batches that failed, uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the right. safety right. tests weren't right. sufficient, <laughs> and so on. Okay, all of that is true, but that doesn't, in my mind, absolve 
that f the pharmaceutical companies who did not mm -hmm. follow that procedure from their responsibility to have followed the procedure that was sure. that was laid out. Well, I have to tell you that uh, I was involved with in some litigation revolving around Sabin's vaccine, and the blame is always placed <laughs> on the manufacturer of the vaccine. So things have changed, I think, a lot. I did read the Cutter incident, and I know that this is what Offit concludes, but my reading as a scientist is that the company really made a mistake and they didn't do the thing properly. Yeah. And I would, I, I, I would agree with that uh, completely. Um, one thing that Offit does say is he believes that that, well, that began the, old, the whole, uh, all the litigation around product liability, he says, began with that. And then the lawyers, you know, fancy Hollywood lawyers got involved. And from that point on, every product made by a company was scrutinized. And there were lots of subsequent lawsuits. And that may be true. Uh, and he also says that that began the real anti-vaccine movement, which if your father had any sense, I guess he didn't at the time because it was too long ago. But I can imagine that this would be devastating to think that. It's like blaming Hillary Koprowski for starting uh, the AIDS uh, epidemic by testing polio vaccines in Africa. Once Koprowski said to me, I feel terrible when they say this, and I know it's not true. Mm -hmm. So this is the Cutter incident, and Paul Offit's book is pretty detailed. It's a very it's good, a good account of it. it. Is. And I'm sure um, your dad was quite upset, but eventually they recovered and they, they corrected uh, whatever the problems were in immunization. And so that's not happened resumed. since. Yeah. And, and in this country, we used IPV until the early 60s, right? And it, that was your father at uh, Salk by that time, or um, when did he move? He, uh, I'll, I'll tell the story of the Institute. Uh, he ended up moving physically to California in 1962 okay. to get a temporary lab started, and the family followed in, in 1963. The, my father was quite concerned because the, you know, Dr. Sabin had been working on a live attenuated right. vaccine with weakened viruses all during the period and had been very opposed to the notion of, a, of an inactivated right. vaccine. That vaccine, the, the oral vaccine, the live vaccine was then tested in, in Russia and the USSR and uh, then brought back to the United States after those those tests and met with a great a, a groundswell of support mm -hmm. within the medical and the scientific community. Um, one of the things that was con of concern to my father was the notion as to, because he was saying, this harks back to medical school, wanting to determine whether an inactivated vaccine can bring a disease fully under control. Right. So this was an experiment that was in process which was about to be interrupted sure. <laughs> when the live vaccine was introduced. Right. So by 1961, Six years after the introduction of the, uh, of the injected and activated vaccine, the incidence of polio had been reduced by 97% right. in, this, in this country. Then the, the live vaccine was introduced, quickly became the vaccine of choice for a variety of reasons we can, we can say something about. The, the problem then being that because the, uh, vi the attenuated viruses mm -hmm at that point were, and still are in the vaccines being used, based on single point, as I understand, single point mutations, right. they could easily um, the revert. Re revert back, <laughs> That's right. and you end up with, with virus that is as paralytic as, uh, as the, the wild virus. Right. And right. So what ended up happening in this country, the, the, there's no question, the live vaccine was very effective in this country mm -hmm. and in um, reducing and then ultimately eliminating wild polio virus here, but there was a residual of 8 to 12 cases a, a year right. continuing, ongoing, unchanging of paralytic disease caused by the live vaccine. So this was of great concern to my father, and, and you know, how, do you, how do you go about making decisions? Why, why would the people who were mm -hmm. in charge of vaccine policy not taking this into account? Why were people at, at one point there wasn't even killed, vir killed vaccine available in this right. country to be right. using. People had no choice. Parents were, were, were not given a choice as to which vaccine to, the, you know, to right. choose for their own 
child. And I, interestingly, our, the, the person who introduced us, Caitlin Hawk, who'd been doing some research on the, uh, the swine flu situation back in 1976 and, mm -hmm. and tangentially will have that related to issues having to do with the inactivated and the live poliovirus vaccines, sent me some, some materials and I looked at one of the handwritten notes from someone at the, at the CDC and on the, um, what's it called, the a ACIP? The ACIP, the, American uh, Commi uh, Committee, Committee on for Immunization, Immunization Policy. Policy, right. Um, and what the note said was, if people were given a choice mm -hmm. without any ACIP recommendations, IPV would be the only vaccine being used. Yeah. Because people would choose for safety and effectiveness. But because the policymakers had decided that the live vaccine was the vaccine of choice for some variety of reasons, this kept on being done, kept on being done, kept on being done. And, and I, a very wonderful person, Walt Ornstein, who I've mm -hmm. gotten to know over the last few years, I've, he's told me about this and I've seen him now, this is in, I think there was a Scientific American, American article which included this story that, um, of his being, I, I think it was on the, the um, ASIP uh, meeting, uh, he was on that, that committee the, and I don't remember which year this was in the, 19, in the late 1990s, the committee was meeting to continue making the vaccine policy and into the room, as I recall, um, walked the 8 to 12, whatever the 10 cases of, of mm -hmm. vaccine-associated right. paralysis from that year. And that made an enormous difference to him because he was concerned, how can you change policy? Here we have something that's working, what if, we, what if we change and go back to the injected vaccine and we've made a huge mistake? But that human factor, at least in his mind, made, made a difference. And then in 1998 and finally in, uh, there was a reintroduction of the inactivated vaccine. Right. And then I believe in 2000, from that point on in this country and in a large number of, of the industrialized right. countries around the world, it's only the inactivated vaccine that's being used because of the safety factor. I often wonder how we tolerated from 62 to 2,000, 8 to 12 kids a year being paralyzed by the vaccine. And on these, these trials that I sat on as a witness, these were always children or parents who had been paralyzed by OPV who were suing. And the lawyers would always say, why did we switch to begin with? Because IPV did not cause except for that first yeah. cutter incident, right. it didn't cause polio at all. Right. And it's really a, a very tough decision. Um, you know, the policy was that it's best for everyone, but uh, I'm not so sure anymore. Yeah. Looking back, in hindsight, of course, is 2020. Mm -hmm. It seems like not, not the right decision. Mm -hmm. So your dad and Albert Sabin had a disagreement about what kind of vaccine would yeah, be they, best. They, they saw the world differently. And they argued about it at meetings often, right? And so your dad was, was opposed to the idea of switching, obviously, in mm -hmm. 1962. Mm -hmm. And I know there are plenty of articles out there, and uh, I've read many of them where your father, and I see some of them may have your name on them as well. That was my brother. Is it your brother? Bro yeah, my brother Daryl worked with my father Darryl, very closely. Right. Yeah. who argued we should be using IPV because of this and that. And uh, unfortunately, your dad died before we switched. He did. But... He, it would have been fitting if he could have made it to that point yeah. and seen, right? That yeah. would have been great. But you guys know, and you've, you've lived a lot of this story yourself, so in, in the U.S. at least. But as you know, the uh, OPV is still being used globally for eradication purposes, and I'd like to get back to that uh, in mm -hmm. a bit. Sure. So your dad, tell us the, the Salk story. What, um, your, your dad moved to the Salk in 1962. He founded it. He raised money and founded it and made a wonderful institution. And he wanted to continue his work there. So that was one of the reasons, right? Yes. He began thinking about a new institute. So the, the vaccine announcement was 1955. Within the next two years, I think, certainly mm -hmm. uh, by 1957, he was thinking about establishing a new kind of research mm -hmm. institution, which he um, wanted to do at the University of Pittsburgh. Right. And this was going to be an institute for experimental medicine, but not only to deal with experimental medicine in the laboratory, but to be dealing with the human problems that had to do with man's relationship to man. Mm -hmm. So that was in his, his mind back then. 
things ended up not working out at the University of Pittsburgh, began to look at California, was attracted to La Jolla, ended up making the decision that the institute would be founded there mm -hmm. with the support of the continuing support of the March of Dimes, which had made a financial commitment to that. Um, and from the earliest moments, the desire was not only to have a research institution that would do solid, fundamental biological research, but also would deal with, as my father would put it, these problems confronting humanity that can't be solved in the laboratory, mm. which would involve interactions among the people working in the biological sciences, the humanities, social sciences, the arts. Um, now, the early on there was some activity of that sort at mm -hmm. the institute, but as time went on, the, it was the, the science was strong, the number of researchers that gathered were, were larger. Yeah. Today, this is a top-ranked mm -hmm. biological research institute, number one in various, in various fields. Uh, it's, 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 it really is quite a, a tribute that this was started out as this experiment with a, a, a few brave mm -hmm. scientists who were willing to come to this yeah. new, you know, new entity. And as you know, my uh, postdoc mentor spent some time there, David Baltimore. Indeed. At the Salk in his early years as well. Yes. And you joined your father there in the 60s, was it? No, uh, I, it was 1972, Two. the beginning of 72. And you did some lab work? Did, Together? Yes. What did you work on? After the polio, um, early on, my father became interested in the relationship between the immune system and cancer. Mm -hmm. There were some early observations in the laboratory that, that grew out of cultivating uh, the polio virus in cells grown in tissue culture. Mm -hmm. One of these was a cell that had initially come from, or a cell line that had come from a monkey, monkey heart tissue. Right. Uh, winding forward, at some point along the way, that, that culture had gotten contaminated by HeLa cells, mm -hmm. and this ended up being a HeLa cell line. But looking at, at um, monkeys that were injected with this cell, mm -hmm. uh, that it would, in some monkeys, tumors would form. And in the monkeys where tumors would form, it turns out there was a TB epidemic going through mm -hmm. the monkey colony. And those monkeys that became tuberculin negative, they no longer had the immune capacity to develop a delayed hypersensitivity response. In those monkeys, tumors would form after these, these cells were injected. Mm -hmm. um, they had high levels of antibody against, tuber uh, against tuberculosis or levels of antibody against the injected, uh, right. the injected cell line. But in those monkeys, uh, and these were monkeys where the TB had been, uh, was advanced enough that the immune system was significantly impaired. In those monkeys that were infected with TB but still had competent cellular immune responses, mm -hmm. positive skin tests, low antibody levels, the cells wouldn't grow to form a tumor. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, there was this interesting relationship mm -hmm. of high cell cellular immunity, low antibody, protection against tumor growth, right low cellular immunity, high antibody, tumors grew. So this became the beginning of a long series of projects that had to do with looking at cancer and the immune system with the basic question, can one manipulate the immune system in such a way as to boost the, uh, an effective immune response against cancer? Which continues to this day. It does. Immunotherapy for cancer yeah. is a, a big area of investigation, as is using viruses to cure cancers. I don't know if you're familiar with this area, but it's an area that's just grown in the last 10 years. Uh, tumors tend to have poor immunity, uh, innate immunity in particular, so viruses grow really well in them. And so people are using viruses to target. And in fact, there's a group here in the U.S. that's using polio to uh, target glioblastomas. Mm -hmm where the virus replicates exquisitely. And so polio, as you know, is a very lytic virus. It kills the cells that it replicates in. So if it's a tumor, then um, the tumor is gone. And many other viruses are being used for this. It looks very promising, in fact. So you got into the lab yourself. and I did. 
were doing this. Did you like that? I, actually, I loved it. <laughs> I, I really liked being at the bench, looking through microscopes, yeah. manipulating the, the cells myself. It, it began to get a little bit out of hand because I started to um, then ended up doing experiments in rats and we had we ended up with quite a large population yeah. and people you know, taking care of the, of the animals and working with a technician or so to, yeah. Yeah. to deal with things. I, I, I did love that phase when I was doing it with my own hands. And when did you move into the legacy, the, the Jonas Salk Legacy Foundation? That's, uh, that's been more recently. Mm -hmm. So my father closed his laboratory in 1984. I did the work with him on, the, on cancer, participated in a uh, clinical trial that was going on with mm -hmm. an approach to multiple sclerosis therapy. After um, he closed his lab, some years, actually it's not that many years later, he got interested in the AIDS epidemic and the, mm -hmm. the possibility of making an, an a, a vaccine against HIV right. based on the same kind of, mm -hmm. of formula of using an inactivated virus together with a potent adjuvant. And I came back and worked with him a bit, not at the Institute, on that project for a number of years until, until his death. Mm -hmm continued on with that project which was being handled by a, a, a company at, at that point um, for a, a number of years after that. Then just leading up to the time of the 50th anniversary of the polio vaccine mm -hmm. announcement, I began to get more and more drawn into things that had to do with my father's history. Right. And, and particularly being interested not only in the work with vaccines, the work with the Institute, which is an, an enormous accomplishment of its own. But there is another aspect of my father's life which isn't well known, mm -hmm. but which is, is very, was extremely meaningful and important to him. And, and I, I, I feel that it, was, it still it, it has the potential to make a contribution in a, a larger scale. And that has to do with his thoughts about where humanity finds itself today in the evolutionary scheme of things. Mm -hmm. Where have we come from, where are we now, and where might we be going? One of the models that he used harks back to that same sigmoid curve that I mm -hmm. mentioned antibody, before, yeah. which is antibodies, or if you take a couple of fruit flies and put them in a closed container and continue to feed them, the population will grow exponentially but because of the limited spatial constraints, somehow, even though they're continuing to be fed, the fruit flies know enough within their genetic makeup or what have you that the population mm -hmm. stabilizes. So it forms this S-shaped curve. If you take deer, on the other hand, put them in an environment, the population will grow. If it's a limited environment, they eat up all the food the population crashes. There's no self-regulatory mechanism of the kind that pertains to fruit flies or bacteria or cells put in culture. What is our situation? Mm. If we look back in the past, mm -hmm. there were, there were there's a huge amount of time where the human population was relatively flat, right. grew very slowly. Then, with the increase of knowledge and technology, with the industrial revolution and the scientific revolution in the last couple of hundred years, the growth has been mm. exponential. So what are the possible trajectories for us to follow? Uh, I'll try and keep my mouth uh, appropriate here. Some might imagine that this could go on forever. The growth mm -hmm. is wonderful and good, and we just keep going and going and going, but we're living on a finite planet. It's physically not possible. It just can't sure. happen. Sure. So are we going to follow the trajectory of the deer, or are we going to be smart as, as smart as fruit flies mm -hmm. and be able yeah. to modulate whatever it is that it takes so that we will stabilize our population and, and reach a, a, a situation of, of sustainability into the future. So where are we now? Now my father was thinking and writing about this and, and in the same way he worked with my brother Daryl on, mm -hmm. on uh, polio and on the vaccine, he worked with my youngest brother Jonathan on a book called World Population and Human Values, A New Reality. 
when that was written, I've lost track of how many years ago, maybe almost 30 years ago, maybe 30 years ago now, we were still on this exponential phase. The point of inflection hadn't been reached, but if I'm not mistaken, it has been at this point. The population is beginning to tilt over. So, right. so it's going from this constantly upward um, phase to, to this leveling off phase, the point of inflection, this is happening now in our generation. And if you, if you graph the change in slope, it's a, it's a, it's a very relatively narrow point in time that we're confronted with this transitional phase in our human species. This, this has never happened before on the global scale, mm. may never happen again. So we have a unique challenge. And what have we got to do if we're going to make the change? And my father's thinking was that there are two sets of dynamics. One set of dynamic in what he called Epic A, this first portion of the growth curve, and another set of dynamics in Epic B. And that what the, the qualities and values and attributes, ways of thinking that were of great success mm -hmm. in Epic A may not be the same set sure. of values sure. that are required to be successful in Epic B. Not that we have to reinvent the human species, we have all these range of characteristics, competition, growth as the predominant um, you know, ethos, right. overcoming external constraints. We also have within us cooperation, mm -hmm. mutualism, imposing self-restraints. So we have the whole range of possible behaviors, and in his mind it was a question of changing the emphasis, changing the emphasis off of competition, growth as being the predominant, to cooperation, yeah. self-restraint. So, so somehow we have to, at least in his mind, the job we have in front of us as a human species is to make those changes within our interrelationships, man's relationship to man, man's relationship to, him, to himself, our relationship, with, our relationship to our own selves, that will enable us to be sure. successful. This is a, there's a wonderful exhibit at the German Technology Museum in Munich. It's a, it's a construction of population growth. And there's a, it's a piece of wood, and you see that for years and years and years the population is pretty flat. And then all of a sudden it shoots way up in the last yeah. years, yeah. very short. So yeah. it's a graph that all of a sudden goes way up. Yeah. So we, uh, Dixon de Pommier, my colleague, and I started a podcast about urban farming, and, and food availability is one of the limitations for Mm -hmm. population growth and if we are to continue we have to figure out how to make that sustainable because at the current pace it's not yeah. we're going to run out of farmland yeah. in 50 years we won't be able to feed people it's really interesting that your dad went from vaccinology to this I mean many scientists do change throughout their careers because of the the vision that science gives them. It sometimes gives you a broad vision of humanity. So that's not at all surprising to me at all. Uh, and um, so the, the Legacy Foundation hopes to perpetuate this thinking? Yeah, I, absolutely. The Salk Institute is taking care of the science. Right. And they're tops. What hasn't been fully developed in terms of my father and his life and his thinking and his legacy is this latter. Mm -hmm aspect. So that's of, of great importance to me to try mm -hmm. and continue that, sure. explore the applicability of that kind of thinking in the various realms in which challenges persist. And the, the funny thing is, you know, nowadays you, you raise the, the question of the eradication program. I think it, it all comes back together in a way because here we're dealing with a viral disease. Mm -hmm. We have two vaccines that are being used effectively in appropriate combinations. Don't have to worry about those details at, at the moment. And with an eradication program that's been officially underway since 1988 mm -hmm. with huge success. H having taken the number of, of cases globally from somewhere uh, at the beginning of the official eradication program, around 350,000 cases a year in 125 countries, down to the, the lowest number of mm -hmm. cases caused by wild virus in 2012, 223. And at that point, um, there's only three countries that in which the, the 
wild virus had never been eliminated. Last year, it was an yeah, uptick. An uptick, unfortunately. And yeah. now we just, as of yesterday or the day before, now virus has spread. It had gone from Pakistan, one of those countries where it has never been eliminated, Syria, because of the right. upheaval and the reduction in the in immunization systems, and now from Syria to Iraq. So people have been trying very, very hard to complete this effort with WHO, UNICEF, Rotary International, mm -hmm. the CDC partnering with the Gates Foundation coming in to provide resources to get this job done, finish the eradication mm -hmm. program, are we okay on time? We're okay. Just okay. Making sure everything's okay. <laughs> Good. All right. Um, to get this job done, there's just been there's been what something on the order of ten billion dollars put into this mm -hmm. process up to this point, and it would be fantastic to finish this to have another success under our belts of the type that took place with, with the eradication of smallpox back in the in the end of the seventies. But what are we facing here? We have the scientific issues, the vaccines and the application issues, how do we use them and so on. But we're still facing the kinds of complex human to human interactions sure. that we find, for example, in Pakistan, they're also in Nigeria, also in Afghanistan, those are those three remaining countries. Pakistan's a particular problem as, as far as I can see because of the, the political differences in different parts of the country and decisions that have been made in some parts of the country not to allow vaccinators mm -hmm. in. So you have unvaccinated pockets of kids mm -hmm. until we can resolve these human issues of human relationships, politics, religion, cultural differences, we're not going to eliminate polio. So these, these two ends of the extreme of my father's life. Science and vaccines yeah. <laughs> and man's relationship to yeah. man. This is very practical. This is not theoretical. If we're yeah. going to get this job done, we're going to have to deal with this entire spectrum of, of issues. Do you think he might have predicted, if he had seen the eradication where it is now, do you think he would have predicted that, that the human issues would have been crucial in the end? I, I don't. Things were not that far along when, yeah. he, when he left us. The human issues that he was dealing with at that point had to do with some of the human issues surrounding choice of vaccines sure, and, and, sure. and those kinds of decisions. Right. But I think if he were here today, absolutely, he would be looking at it from this perspective. So WHO has now uh, acknowledged that we need to gradually transition to inactivated polio vaccine. So OPV has been used for the bulk of the eradication, and we know that vaccine-derived uh, viruses persist, so we need to switch to uh, IPV. What, what is, what's your view of this? Does this make sense to you? or do you, do you, so We've never used IPV on a global scale, and some people are worried that it might not work in certain areas. What, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, a couple of things. In the early years, IPV was used alone as the only vaccine mm -hmm. in a number of countries in Scandinavia right. and, and, and the Netherlands, and the virus was eliminated, eradicated right. from, from those countries, couldn't even find it in the sewage. So at least in those areas, the inactivated poliovirus vaccine alone was able to do the job. Whether that's the case elsewhere in the world is another question. But just to precede that, one of the features of the live vaccine that was promoted as a concept mm -hmm. harked back to my father's medical school days, which is this notion that somehow a live virus would be more potent, more effective, longer lasting immunity. No evidence for any one of those ideas claims with respect to the polio vaccine. Now, maybe I'm getting myself out on a limb by being so definitive in saying that, and I, and I have to say I, I, have, I carry two different perspectives within me. One is the perspective that I couldn't help but grow up with for decades. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> the other is what I now know intellectually, yeah. and so I, I, I perhaps should tone myself down a little bit in terms of I, I, if I allow some of the early That's emotions okay. to, um, 
to, to come through, and I, and I will, because I'll say something about that. But one of the, the things about the live vaccine is that it hasn't worked very well in some areas. In those parts of the world where there's malnutrition and the intestinal tract isn't capable of supporting the, I, I don't know actually, I, I don't know how malnutrition enteropathy works to reduce the effectiveness right. of the attenuated that's well known that vaccine. that's the case. Yeah, we don't quite know how, but you're right, it does. In places where that occurs, you have to give many, many doses of, of OPV, right? And, and whether there may be competing enteroviruses. Exactly. So the, right. those two different issues, but what, whether it's one, the other, or both, and, yeah. and how yeah. it works, the observation has been that you may, it may take 10 or 15 doses of the live vaccine adequately to immunize sure. a child. Sure. which is just the opposite end because with with pol with the inactivated vaccine now the early preparation was had a particular level of potency right, right. in the 70s um, using technology developed in the Netherlands an enhanced IPV was right. put together which mm -hmm. is much more potent right. and which is capable of inducing now what is it capable actually of doing? The, the postulate was that it could induce immunity with a single dose or with two doses. Right. Whatever number and in whatever situations I think um, may remain to be seen, but a small number of doses could produce adequate mm -hmm. immunity. Right. So it's, it's, we're sort of, it's, it's a flip situation to what had been touted and, and anticipated. And when, when I look at what's been done, you, you can't change a train that's moving full speed. I mean, you can't, you, the, the not erratic... Not easily anyway. No, not, not, <laughs> not easily. So the eradication program has been built around the ease of administration of right. the live vaccine. A couple of drops in the baby's Very mouth. Very easy, yes. By untrained people. You don't need medical, trained medical personnel. You don't have disposal you know, syringes mm -hmm. to be dealt with and dangerous medical waste and so on. Rotary's been fantastic, not only supplying uh, the, the funding for the, mm -hmm. a, a good chunk of funding for the, the program, but also sending its people into the field to act as vaccinators right. and, and so on. So this, is, this has been a, a, a great strong point. But the other side of it is, as, as I think about it, and I just read uh, an article online uh, a, a day or so ago, uh, which is quoting one of the people in, in WHO, saying that you know you need multiple rounds of immunization. Where well, he was talking about Iraq, and that it, it, you know that it may take. He didn't use a number. I don't think he said 10 to 15. But it takes multiple rounds of immunization to immunize a child. So how much have we gotten ourselves into a self-perpetuating mode of, with these? massive, large-scale immunization programs with, with the drops. And if you compare costs, I haven't done these calculations, mm. and so this is all just you know, general hand-waving, uh, in a sense, on, on my part, but there's been so much momentum built up around these large-scale immunization programs. How much of the, with, with a vaccine, the, the live vaccine, which is much cheaper than the injected vaccine, Part is a question of scale, of, course. of, of production, yeah. and, and sure. IPV being out of favor. It's, uh, it's, you know, it could be as cheap if it were scaled up. I, I, I th think so. Yeah. I mean, that argument really is not doesn't hold. If if you scale up to the same extent as OPV, IPV would be five cents a dose. Also. Yeah. Now, what I'm going to jump ahead and just say, I'm particularly enamored by a project that's being take, taking place in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Mark Prausnitz and his group looking at uh, dissolvable microneedle uh, right. uh, patches. Yeah, the patches, you, you have tiny needles, you band-aid onto your... You band-aid onto, onto, your... onto the skin, yeah. and yeah. then the microneedles, they're not metal, they're made out of the vaccine itself. Right, they dissolve. So they dissolve yeah. within, within a couple of minutes That's in the skin, great. take the band-aid off, throw it away, nothing dangerous, no medical waste. No. If this turns out to be as effective, as the injected vaccine, and I don't have any reason to right. believe that it won't be, I think this could make an enormous difference sure. in terms of the ease of application, no medical waste, trained personnel, and so on. Now, it, it looked, I, I've been in touch with Mark over the over these mm -hmm. last couple of years, and whereas at first it seemed it would take you know, five years or something to get this program underway, there's now, as I understood from a number of months ago, support is, is being mobilized to try and get this project yep. rolled out 
in another couple of years. So that would be, that's I, very I think good. that would I love that. I think that's a great approach. Yeah. Let me just say one thing. So I think there's, there's never going to be one solution for everything. You made a statement before comparing uh, attenuated versus inactivated vaccines. The common wisdom always, has always been that a natural infection will always provide the most durable immunity. Why? However, okay. I mean, that's, that's true with some viruses, but we know that with norovirus that cause gastroenteritis, you can be infected many times. You don't have durable immunity. So in those cases, we have to figure out a way to get around yeah. that. That could be an infectious vaccine, it could be a subunit, it could be anything. We have to be very creative mm -hmm. and, and mold the situation to what we need. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in the old days, the proclamations that this is better than this, you can't do that because every situation is going to be different. That's my take on it anyway. Yeah. Now, here's the hooker in the situation at the moment. So, my bias, of course, f familial in mm -hmm. a sense, would be, yes, it would be fantastic to make the transition back to IPV. Question is, when it comes to eradicating the virus, will IPV alone be sufficient to do the job? Now, the reasoning there being mm -hmm. this other element, yeah, which is the so-called intestinal immunity. Right. And if it, you stop me if we, you know, if we have the time. No, issue, we have but time. Just... I have, we have a half hour before I have to go teach. Okay. Plenty of time. Okay, good. So. My father never thought very much of that early on. Mm -hmm. He recognized that the live vaccine might have advantages in an epidemic situation where you needed to immunize the population very quickly. Right. The, the part of the notion being, well, there are two, two aspects to it. One, that the injected vaccine produces antibodies in the bloodstream. It may have an effect on immunity in the gut, in the intestinal tract. Right. The, Oral vaccine, the live vaccine, not only produces antibodies in the bloodstream, but it also produces a local immunity, a mucosal Correct. immunity. Correct. So what that means is that children immunized with OPV, if a wild virus or a revertant mm -hmm. oral OPV virus comes along, it won't be able to establish itself in an adequately immunized child right. and then get, get passed on. I've seen some data, I mean, there have been a number of studies about this. I don't think the answer has been really completely pinned down, but um, Walt Ornstein sent me at one point a chapter that Roland Sutter had written mm -hmm. in, uh, I think it was in, in uh, the vaccines book that Walt had been in, one of the compilers of. And it was looking at the area under the curve in terms of the, uh, the amount of virus excreted in people who'd been immunized with IPV versus OPV. And okay. if I'm remembering the outcome of that correctly, basically IPV was, a, was about 95% as effective as OPV mm -hmm. in reducing the total amount of virus shed. So the question is, what's the practical implication of right. that? Is that, right. you know, is, is that, that difference enough, yeah. enough to, make, you know, to make a difference in terms of this, this right. eradication effort? Well, you know, I've, I've been thinking, oh, it's, you know, this, this, it needs to be put to the test, but um, my desire would be to think that, that the IPV would actually do the job. But I've been shaken in that, that assumption by the data that have come from Israel over exactly. the, the last year, yes. where the population has been immunized exclusively with IPV since around 2005, something, something of that sort. But they've now found wild poliovirus, which has come from Pakistan to Egypt and gotten into Israel. Right. They're find, they've found that in the sewage. Right. They've tested stool samples from people and have found the virus in the stool samples, including among individuals who've been immunized with IPV. Right. What they've not seen, to my knowledge to this point, has been any, have been any cases of paralysis. That's correct, right. So you have people who are adequately protected against paralysis, but still virus is being able to be transmitted sure. within sure. the population because of not having sufficient intestinal immunity. So what does this, what does this mean? You need to stop OPV, ultimately, if we're going to right. eradicate polio, because otherwise it's continuing to seed the population with right. live virus that can revert to, to virulence. We need to stop the type 2 OPV in 
the, in the, the uh, oral vaccine soon because no wild OPV has been seen since 1999 right. and the predominance of cases of paralysis caused by OPV are type 2. two yeah. So that needs to be done soon. That's why IPV is now being reintroduced for both of those reasons right. and introduce it now so we can get type 2 OPV out of the system and then ultimately stop, stop it altogether. I'm puzzled. Mm. I don't know how this will then play out. What do you do? Israel is making the, the what experiment. seems to be the correct decision, yeah, yeah. reintroduce OPV to get the intestinal I'm immunity sure, out. But that re now reintroduces all the strains, the vaccine revertance again, right? This is a really interesting question, which has been bugging me for years. And I think the type two is the experiment. Because if we transition globally to IPV type 2, we can see if eventually that, that intestinal immunity is enough to push down the amount of uh, type 2 in the absence of, of introducing any more type 2 via mm -hmm. OPV. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the answer. I don't think anyone knows. I don't think anyone has the data. I think if you looked in the U.S. that's been using IPV since 2000, I'll bet you would find uh, polio in the sewer. In the U.S.? I'll bet you would. It's probably imported routinely from Pakistan and, and places where it's the wild strains are. Yeah, I don't know if it's, I don't know what surveillance is being done None. in the sewage in this I, country. I asked someone at the CDC and they said, Vincent, we don't look because we don't know how to explain it if we do find it. <laughs> <laughs> you can That's imagine scary. if yeah. they found it in the sewage in the U.S., uh, it would be a, a nightmare because then there'd be calls for uh, OPV and I think that would be a big mistake because we don't have a lot of circulating yeah. vaccine derived strains. Yeah. This is a really good question because it's clear now that we are transitioning to IPV. We don't want to use it forever but if there's continuous circulation in the gut you have to because if you stop then those will cause. So it's, it's an interesting problem. Yeah. I think what one, I don't know that we have the luxury of time to do this if one could go back and reinvent both vaccines, mm -hmm. if you could go back and reinvent an attenuated polio vi virus vaccine mm -hmm. that could not revert, that would be one route to go. If it you would. then have, it okay. would, yes. Another route would be if you could use an adjuvant, a substance added to vaccines yes. to increase the potency, to add to IPV in such a way that parenteral or inject, immunization by injection could induce stronger immunity in the intestinal tract. That might be another way to go. I think you're absolutely right. I think we need to keep exploring different avenues for immunizing the gut because it's not just polio. It's rotavirus and norovirus that are well, Roto is, is, seems to be controlled by the vaccine, but neuro, we can't make a vaccine. We have to understand how to immunize the gut, and polio can provide some lessons, I think. Uh, let's wrap up with uh, a few thoughts on the 100th anniversary of your father's birth, which is yes, this year. Is that it, correct? It is indeed. He was born October 28th of 1914. So this year, uh, actually, this year, 2014, is the centenary but we're also going to be continuing from October through October mm -hmm. to include uh, 2015. And as, as I see it, it's an opportunity to look back on what my father did in his life, the huge accomplishment with the poliovirus vaccine, which now is you know, in play again as far as the, mm -hmm. the end stage of this, uh, hopefully what will be the end stage of this eradication program, the great contribution of the Salk Institute, and then also this more expanded perspective of how do we deal sure. with our human, our human problems. So I, I'm wanting to see this year be used. There will be events taking place uh, in, in different parts of the world, certainly at the University of Pittsburgh where mm -hmm. the polio vaccine work was done, at the Salk Institute, here in New York, the institutions where he went to school at um, C uh, City College, right, at right. Uh, NYU. There'll be some events taking place in, in Europe and, and elsewhere. So this is just an, it's an opportunity to build on this legacy that was left and inspire us to do what we can now to deal with comprehensively with the human problems we're facing and try and get ourselves on a good footing to move ahead into the future. Sounds like a great celebration. Yeah. Is there anywhere people can go to find out 
about what's happening where hopefully soon there's a, there's a, a website there is a website for the Jonas Salk Legacy Foundation mm -hmm. jslf.org but it's it's quite out of date mm -hmm. um, I have not had the technological <laughs> capacity myself to update it but it's very soon there'll be something we'll have a centenary website that will be up so soon there'll be something to refer to so we'll to. put a link in the show notes jsl j slf.org Jonas Salk Legacy Foundation .org. You, you got a four letter domain name that's yeah. good you must have had it for a while yes because those are hard to get nowadays yeah. yeah well Peter I really appreciate your coming to do this with me today I think it's been a great conversation you told me at lunch that you didn't know anything about vaccines but I don't believe you now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to know I, quite a bit I always <laughs> want to know more than I think and I do. you've kept up with polio eradication, which should not surprise me, right? Because after all, your dad did make the first uh, polio vaccine. It looks like we're going to have started with IPV and we're going to perhaps end with it as well. Yeah. That would be quite something. So this episode of TWIV will be at twiv.tv and also at iTunes. And if you like what we do, one way that you can help us is to go on over to iTunes and give the show a rating or a comment that helps to keep this, the show visible in the very crowded podcast directory. If you have any questions or comments, please send them to twiv at twiv.tv. And I'm sure Peter would be happy to answer some of them. Yeah, sure, send them absolutely. along to him if you have questions Good. about Jonas Salk or IPV or eradication. Send them along, twiv at twiv.tv. And once again, I want to thank... Uh, Peter Salk, who is at the Jonas Salk Legacy Foundation. Thank you, Peter. You're welcome. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Mm -hmm.